Good morning, good morning, good morning. How are you? Ah, oh, what a lovely morning. I'm sitting here, I'm thinking it's freezing, I'm freezing. And I've got all the blowers on, because I've had the hot air blowing out yesterday and now they're blowing out cold air and I've forgotten to turn them all off. But anyway, this car's got automatic nothing, nothing, nothing. I have to, uh, my the other car, the Suzuki, it's great. You put it on, tell it what temperature you want. It doesn't even turn the blowers on until it, it, it can warm the car up, you know? But not this thing, this is, this is the Flintstones car, this. As you can probably tell from the noise it's making. I put some uh, audio filters on to try and cut out the grinding of the uh, wheel bearing that's uh, playing up. So anyway, yesterday's competition was to try and guess why I had a pair of women's knickers in my briefcase and an empty 5 litre container of concentrated screen wash in the post box. Um, we had no entries at all for this competition surprisingly. <laughs> so nobody's going to win the Bitcoin. But uh, basically the answer was that uh, I was outside uh, getting ready to go to work. I realized I had no concentrated screen wash. So I topped up the car and I left this uh, and I was, the car was running and I was, I was ready to go and you know, I had to leave. So and I didn't want to just throw the uh, container in the hedge. So I put it in the post box where my wife found it much to her consternation three days later. And as for the knickers thing, apparently my wife lent her knickers to someone and uh, that person uh, returned them by putting them back in my briefcase. Because so, they knew that it would be going back home. But uh, they didn't tell me, and or uh, well, they did, and I forgot. And my wife forgot that she lent her knickers to someone because it was weeks ago. And so there you go. So, mystery solved once we both got our brains in gear. Anyway, so we'll come up with another competition. Bearing in mind we had no entries for this one, probably not. So, <clears throat> how are you anyway? All right, how are things going? I hate this light, this light is so annoying. <clears throat> That's the bit where it shines directly in my face. Just that corner, and it's, it plays havoc with the um, exposure. I can muck about with the exposure, I can, I can bring the exposure down like that, that might be better. It depends whether you want to have it, half of it too light, half normal, or half of it too dark, and then the rest normal. Anyway, we'll see how we get on with that. So, well, yeah, so what's been going on with you then? I had a phone call yesterday from someone, not, not a member of the association. Uh, we occasionally get this, you know, we get these people ring up who are been recommended to us because they know the association is pretty damn good um, but they're recommended you know by people who say oh yeah you know these guys can help you out and they don't they don't mention that in fact we're a subscription only group and that we only help out members of the group <laughs> but I suppose if you're you know we, we provide a unique service and so of course we get referrals but uh, unfortunately sometimes people are just not members of the group. That's not to say that we just hang up on them and I mean I always do try and find out what the problem is and give them some... Uh, my, our philosophy is to give sort of initial advice, you know, give initial advice and then if you if someone says yeah that advice was valuable I want to sort of I enter into an ongoing relationship with you, you know, to, to for support and uh, then we negotiate what uh, but the one thing I won't do and this is this is it's more common than I'd like to you know I'd like to uh, think is that uh, people ring you with a ton of problems they ring you at the end of a massive great procedure whereby they've been you know like they've been three years into the process of dealing with the General Dental Council, dealing with their defence unions, and they sort of, they get to the point where they just ring anybody. And, or, or it's taken them three years for the news and the sort of assistance that we give to filter through to them. Somebody has finally said, you know, these, you know, why didn't you try these guys? And by that point, we're coming in right at the end of a problem. And we had a situation like that yesterday where this uh, guy rang up, not a member, but uh, very sort of desirous of advice and uh, you know you get the you know you get the 
you learn to recognize it and it's understandable they want you you know to get as much advice out of you as possible without talking about them paying anything for the advice you know so so basically the situation was this this guy had been he'd done something hooky he'd been suspended for nine months by the interim orders committee then uh, gone to fitness to practice and not been struck off but had registrations conditions imposed on his registration and this whole process had taken about three four years I don't know you know there was about a year when he was suspended and then two years he's been he's been on probation and having to work under get a personal development plan together and work with the local dean and um, there's two there's two sort of characteristics I find of these sort of people I had I had um, a very similar case where I used to go and inspect dentists on behalf of WR Berkeley the uh, Lloyd's underwriters because uh, where, where, a, where a guy was um, I forget they have a name for it it's not tainted it's sort of compromised or something where, where they've got an application where they can't really judge the risk what they used to do was send me around to um, have a chat with a dentist and see if he's a, a bad egg or a good one, you know. And you can tell pretty well straight away, you can tell within like 30 minutes of walking in the door whether these guys are okay or not. And I was able to provide them with pretty detailed reports that, you know, were related to the risk assessment. But um, uh, you used to get a thing, I used to get a thing where like there was a there was a guy who'd gone into trouble with the general dental council over his endo because he wasn't taking um, post-operative x-rays and there's not much doubt about this I mean even in the draft the new draft for the FT GDP on the uh, uh, standards for the practice standards you know I forget what it's called now but it's a standards document and um, sort of thing that should be provided by the BDA but apparently I don't know what they're doing but they've left it to the GDP and uh, they they say you know post-operative X-rays for endo, not not a, not negotiable, you know, has to be done. So this guy's not taking post-operative X-rays. So he got into trouble with the GDC over that, and uh, and as a result, he was having trouble getting indemnity. So they asked me to go round and see whether he was a you know dodgy or not. Which he wasn't. I mean, he was sort of—he uh, was one of that sort of generation, the sort of the fifty thousand generation on the GDC register who are, you know, were not not even the, perhaps the forty thousand generation, the, the 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 guys who grew up with the dodginess of the NHS fee for item, who were constantly bending the rules and trying to work out how they could claim for fees, you know, to bend the clinical situation to claim an extra fee, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. They were sort of the the Dell boys of the dental world and uh, and he was he was he was on the edge of that you know he brought all his equipment in from uh, Poland all his, all his all his chairs and everything were all coming in and and he was like you know he's like look at that surgery how much do you think it cost me to equip that surgery and I said I don't know and he said he's like two and a half thousand pounds you know that includes the chair the suction <laughs> all the lino all the cabinets <laughs> etc <laughs> so uh, you know, which is, no, and I've got no objection to that, but I did say to him, are you taking, are you now taking x-rays after your endo? And he said, no, I am not. <laughs> and I'm like, honestly, honestly, this guy nearly got struck off because he didn't take post-operative x-rays. And then, and then he tells me that he's decided that despite everything, he's right and the GDC is wrong and he's going to carry on doing it even if they find out and they and this time they would have struck him off the second time so and this is I'm going to come back to this point you know this sort of I know best because it, uh, we, you know you see it a lot in the, what I call the, like the quasi sort of dysfunctional GDPs this is what you, you see it in them they're, uh, they're not only are they outliers but they are they're deliberately outliers in certain areas. They're outliers by choice. And that's precisely what the GDC wants to iron out. It wants to iron out these maverick GDPs who've, who've got weird ideas, you know, that, uh, <coughs> you know, that like taking out a tooth and stuffing the socket with mud from the garden is, it aids healing. All these, all this quack or snake oil type stuff 
anything that's really not mainstream they want to iron it out <clears throat> so I said to this guy look <laughs> if I was you if I was doing what well, if I wasn't sterilizing my instruments I would be taking post-operative x-rays I said why don't you do it he says I've got an apex locator he says my apex locator I trust it 100% he said if it tells me I'm at the apex I'm at the apex if I filter the apex why why do you subject the patient to an x-ray to, to find out what you already know and I said because the GDC tells you to <laughs> okay okay I follow your logic I follow your line of reasoning I've got an apex locator I trust mine 100% as well however GDC wants an x-ray it's a small amount of you know you can't argue on the one hand that the people shouldn't object to bite wings on the grounds that it's a tiny a minuscule irrelevant inconsiderable amount of radiation and then use that argument as an argument against taking post-operative x-rays for uh, for um, <clears throat> for RCTs you know so so at least be consistent in your inconsistency but uh, I said to him look you know you've got a good practice here he's obviously a good dentist uh, he was a good dentist as well but he just got this funny thing this idea that he he you know discovered like a, a, a way of improving efficiency that the GDC hadn't quite cottoned on to yet <laughs> anyway so where so how does this relate to our guy right who's been who'd not been struck off but, but been put on probation he rang up because he couldn't get a job right he's basically he says I want to get back into employment and uh, I'm living on benefits by which I presume he means state benefits so and there are dentists who live on state benefits that's you know I mean I was on the BDA benevolent fund or the benevolent fund as I used to call it but the, or the BDA benevolent fund as the BDA used to call it and uh, <clears throat> you know there's some there's some dentists who are pretty well you know down there with everyone else in terms of struggling financially so let's just try and adjust this contrast again it's not going to go is it no oh wait a minute there we are so it's a shame it just doesn't adjust automatically I might be able to get it to adjust automatically anyway <clears throat> so I'm talking to this guy and these phone calls take about half an hour typically this one took about 40 minutes so so slightly longer than normal because because I'm saying things to him and he's sort of arguing back you know he's pushing back he's rung for advice and I'm giving him advice and I'm, I'm basically you might not agree with it or you might not welcome it but he has rung and asked for it uh, and it's the advice of an unbiased independent third party who never met the bloke before and with some experience of dealing with these sort of matters you know so I'm not just talking through my hat uh, you know I've seen this I've seen cases like his before I know I know how people arrive in these situations and I know how they get out of them as well and we had one one girl who was a very very good dentist very good but came in wanted an NHS performer number and was told that her qualification didn't entitle her to uh, registration in the UK so she had to work under supervision for six months in you know sort of quasi vocational training role and the only job she could get was uh, one where she wasn't paid anything she's absolutely paid nothing the principal kept the whole lot and every day for six months she came to work she did a ton of work and went home with absolutely nothing now and and I mean okay her husband was able to support her um, and she is now owns a practice and is a very successful dentist well quite successful but uh, but my point is that um, you know she recognized that she had to do that I was actually more annoyed about it than her she was saying yeah well at least it means I can get a job and I was saying no what it means is that the dental profession has taken a, a dive for the worse that you know this is the first time I've heard of principals being able to hire associates for nothing basically distressed vulnerable associates for nothing and I don't think it's a good uh, I don't think you know it, I think people should resist it and should say no but she's like no I know what I'm doing and she did know what she was doing she she was able to support herself and now she's where she is but this guy he's he's like he hasn't had a job for 18 months he says he doesn't want to apply to a load of people because 
a blunderbuss approach is not for him. He does not have a load of blunderbuss rejections. It's going to be no good. He wants to know whether it would be a good idea to apply for um, uh, through an agency. And I said, yeah, well, you know, why not? I mean, why, 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 well, even the, why ask the question? I mean, if you can do it, why not? Um, and a lot of um, lot of associates who, you know, can't hold down a full-time job or then or open a practice, uh, do agency work. So, but apparently he's prohibited from doing locum work, so he would need to have some sort of long-term arrangement. But then, but then he said, I said to him, yeah, why not? You know, and he said, well, I. He said, but I've done that already. So, I, you know, I just don't... You see, his logic is he's asking me questions that he already knows the answer to, you know? So, and and he's sort of... It seemed to me that he was using this sort of blunderbuss approach. I don't want to do a blunderbuss approach as an excuse not to not to do anything. Um, I said to him, it's a job market, basically. He's got through to some second... Uh, he's got through to some second interviews. And then he basically he says that what happens is that the people who are uh, following up the references and things like that um, will then talk to the postgraduate dean and or, and or talk to his caseworker at the GDC, at which point they turn him down for the job. So it's a very much a sort of an infamy, infamy. They've all got an infamy approach. Um, it's everybody else's fault. You know the GDC. Uh, was upset with his record key. The postgraduate dental dean is, is a bitch <laughs> and hates him. Uh, the uh, and then and then after about 25 minutes, you know, he said to me, you know, they they suspended me for nine months and then they hit me with all this all this crap. 16 sets of notes said that I hadn't written the notes up properly. And he, he said, I don't, you know, I don't see why I should have to write the notes. He said, I am not a secretary. These are his exact words. I am not a secretary. I am not paid to be a secretary. I did not train to be a secretary. I will not be a secretary. And uh, I'm like, well, you know, sh we all know these days that notes are crucial. Your, your notes are your first line of defense. In any complaint, you go, you fall back on your notes. Nobody told me that I, don't, I was not trained to write notes at dental school. Nobody told me that I needed to write loads of notes. And and there it is, you know, there it is, that attitude. Do you know what I mean? That that finally, they don't get you don't get through to it straight away. You only get through when you push people hard and say and don't agree with them, you know, and say, no, no, you're wrong about that. That is not how the world works. And then you finally get to the nub of it, you know, that the resistance, the the idea that they're right and the GDC was wrong and that's why people get suspended that's why people get don't get jobs that you know then they're, they're not recruited he, he that's his biggest problem is that he's in a way he sort of refused to believe that he's an adult and that he's a grown-up now and he's responsible for his own actions which is precisely what the GDC is looking for they're looking for mature people who know who near who for know what they don't know do you know what I mean they're they're sort of how can I put it you're you know my daughter's an airline pilot and I don't I don't expect her to turn around and say well nobody told me to land the plane on both wheels at the same time I, I don't remember them saying that at flying school and I didn't I didn't know that was that was a requirement you know and like as a pilot you expect them to know what the requirements are you have to do your own research don't wait for people to tell you stuff you're supposed to know, and he was—he's supposed to know how to write notes up, and he's supposed to know that he needs to write notes up, and he wasn't writing the notes up, and so he got into trouble. But he hasn't accepted that, Do you know. Even after all the trouble he's been in, he's been out of work for a year and a half. He's living on benefits, and he still doesn't understand that the the problem lies within. Yeah. So anyway, I told him to. Uh, I told him to um, just to price himself down a bit, you know, just to go go along. And I said it's a market; it's all about. And because they're saying to him, like, how many UDAs can you do? I said to him, that's it. It's money. It's all it is is money. I said if you go in and tell them that you'll work for 25%, I said you'll get the job. 
And surely 25%'s got to be better than living on benefits. And then once you're clear, free and clear of the probationary terms, you can uh, you can go to your next job, can't you? Safe in the knowledge that you've you've got some experience under your belt and a, and a few a bit on your CV and everything, you know. But I don't know whether he's going to do it. I think he might just stay on benefits. I don't know. It'd be interesting to see how it turns out. He's on the register, but he's not on the register. If you see what I mean. Okay. He's available for work. If anybody wants, uh, if anybody wants an associate who might work for less than fifty percent, let me know. All right, talk to you tomorrow. Bye.